So, again, welcome to this evening's Dhamma Talk. And the Dhamma Talk, for those of you who don't know, that word Dhamma, I mentioned to this, just to someone a couple of days ago, that this scholar, Bhikkhu Bodhi, who I met, he's a scholar, but I had the good fortune many, many years ago, probably 30 years ago, of uh, visiting him in Sri Lanka. And he was looking after this very senior monk, Venerable uh, Jana Ponika, a German monk, who had done lots of translations. And uh, if you read any of those translations we have over in our library, such as the Middle Length Sayings, that was done by him when he was a young monk. And, of course, all monks get old, <laughs> if they last that long. <laughs> but this particular monk was done a lot of good service. And Venerable uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi was looking after him just so beautifully. Just, you know, almost, I was so impressed. I thought this monk was just a scholar. But he was more than a scholar. He was just a very kind disciple friend who was doing everything he possibly could to look after his teacher. It was a very warm thing to see that even scholars had this beautiful kindness and compassion. And when he asked me, can you bring some of the old cassette tape talks we used to have in the old days, and I brought a few with me to give to him, and Bhikkhu Bodhi was just so happy that I could bring a real good gift to a friend. Because other things that, uh, for a monk, you know, what can you get a monk who literally wants for nothing? We don't have everything, but that's all we want, nothing. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why I mentioned my birthday a few moments ago, and I've already seen the first signs of people having cards and all sorts of things for people to sign. And so, if you ever want to give me a gift, which really means a lot to me, Give me nothing. It's weird, it's not just a joke, because something, we have a world which has so much stuff, and sometimes people got more stuff than the others, and stuff really stuffs you up. And just getting it, looking after it, keeping it, and finding a place to put it. It's only in the last, I think, 20, 30 years. I never had this when I was young having these storage places. You see them all over the place because you've got too much junk in your house so you put it in a storage place. And sometimes you think, why? Can't we learn how to live with less? And <laughs> more. I don't know what you two are up to. <laughs> but living with less. So if anybody wants to give me any presents or anything, you can have like a card or something, make it a virtual card, empty, nothing there, just a blank page, <laughs> whatever it is. Because I don't know, I'd really try hard to keep less stuff. Even the shrine here, have a look behind me, how much stuff is on the shrine? And sometimes you try and take that stuff off the shrine. So take all the flowers off, all the knickknacks off. You know what happens? The people think it's no opportunity to put more stuff on. <laughs> and why do we need that? In the, it's very clear in the early time of Buddhism, we didn't have Buddha statues. I know some people say there's some commentaries say there were, but that doesn't make any sense to me because a lot of times that people would represent the Buddha in sculptures, and those sculptures have lasted obviously many couple of thousands of years, they would have like the empty seat, or like the footprint, or like the, the wheel, or the, the tree, but not the person. Because they wanted to realize that it's not just the person which is important, but it's, you know, what was being taught was important. You know, simplicity. And that's one of the reasons why one of the great sayings of the Buddha was, whoever sees the Dhamma, the teachings, the truth, that's where you see the Buddha. 
whoever sees the Buddha, that's where you see the Dhamma. In other words, the Buddha, just the person, is not important, but actually the teachings are. People can worship people, but does that really help? It's one of the reasons why I've taught many times when you do any um, prostrations, if you don't know why you're bowing, it's just an empty ceremony and it doesn't really help at all in the spiritual life. I think one thought which came up for the talk for this evening is when they call like comparative religions, where spirituality meets one another. The different types of religions come together. And they can come together if we notice how to not change our concepts, but adapt the language so other people can embrace you know, what we're actually doing. And that's one of the reasons why I've taught for many years now, whenever I bow to a Buddha statue, I'm not bowing to a piece of metal. And sometimes people can make these very beautiful Buddha statues. Sometimes they can make them out of solid gold, they're worth a fortune. So why do you bow to a lump of gold or a lump of metal or a lump of wood? And you've heard me teach this before. The first bow, I always bow to uh, virtue, goodness, things like trust, honesty. And I hope you understand you can come into this room here on a Friday evening and other days of the the weekend and the week as well, and you are welcome in here. You're not um, asked who you are, are you a member, have you paid a donation, we're going to take your details anyway to harangue you with lots of uh, um, uh, letters and stuff and magazines. People come here free and they leave with no obligations and no duties. It's, that's a kind of trust which we have. Even all those books which are on sale in the library, I don't know if you know this, but all those books which are on sale in the library, if you don't like those books, and I, I say this honestly, you can always ask for your money back. That's a promise. You can always ask for your money back. You won't get it back, but, you <laughs> <laughs> but you're all allowed to ask. That's a promise which is always upheld. <laughs> but the point is, it's all just gentle. And all those times which we've been you know, here, it takes a lot to run this place. But it's always run on donations. And it's wonderful just to see how that works over so many years. And there's always enough in the bank to pay the electricity bills or whatever else. And it's because all your kindness. So this is actually the first bow which I do to a Buddha statue, is to virtue, to goodness, honesty, trust. And if you have an honest, trustworthy group of people, then you find that you can get into better meditation, better peace, better friendship with one another, because you can trust one another. And so because of that, that's of that trust, that friendship based on virtue is a beautiful quality in our world. There used to be a lot of honesty and trust which we had with one another, especially with people in authority like you know, senior monks, policemen, even politicians. You know, I still recall there was, when I was growing up in UK, there was one politician, I think it was the Home Secretary, I think that's almost number two or number three in the government. But he had a friend who was involved in some scandalous activity, and so he resigned. Even though later on, once all the investigations were done, he was totally innocent. It was just because he was a friend of this, this person. I think they went to school together or something. That was the only connection. But he was totally honest, but he said, no, the position of a senior member of the UK government was such, any hint of scandal, I would have to leave. And he did, he was found innocent afterwards. 
but I thought that was a wonderful gesture of honesty so they could trust the people who would lead you know, our nations and our countries. It's very really hard to find that degree of virtue these days. I also remember, I may have said this before after the election here in Australia, that in one jurisdiction, it's only a, an electorate, I think it was in the south of England somewhere, when they elected the mayor, they would always weigh the mayor in public to see how many pounds or kilograms he weighed. And then when he left after his term of office, they would weigh him again. And if on that term of office he put on too much weight, that I think he was fined or something. <laughs> how come you could eat so much? You're supposed to be working for us. <laughs> but that degree of right honesty which was expected in our leaders was something which we don't have these days which was a great shame for us. At least in spirituality, in, in religion, our leaders should be held to a higher standard of virtue than anyone else. And if That's one of the reasons also why when you go to our monasteries on the entry to the rains days, you're part of the ceremony is actually you have the opportunity to visit where we live, have a look inside our huts have a look inside my cave where I live. And that is where I live. It's not just a tourist attraction. <laughs> and it's simple. It actually shows what it's like to be a monk. So you can check me out, there's nothing hidden underneath the, the mattress. At least I don't know, I've never looked under there for years. <laughs> it's all just, you know, we're real. That honesty, that virtue, it's something so wonderful in our world, when we can actually see it and test it out, we can trust in people, then that gives us a sense of safety, we can relax. Just like that story of a friend of mine from school in London, when he came to visit me in Thailand the first time, you know, we'd grown up together, and I told him that in the morning, in Thailand, we go on arms round, it's a very beautiful tradition where the monks go silently through the village and the villagers put a little bit of sticky rice in the bowl. No speech, but just a kind sharing together. And I said, it's at dawn. He said, I can't get up at dawn. I come from London. <laughs> I've never been, <laughs> never been up before nine o'clock or something. And I told him, he said, don't worry. I'll come to your door before dawn and I'll knock on the door to wake you up, which of course I did. The reason I'm telling the story because afterwards he told me that night was very weird for him. He had a very sound sleep, he didn't worry at all because he knew that that's what I said, that's what I would do. And I did get there early in the morning and I did wake him up and he went on the walk, and he said that was something you could never trust in a place like London. Even your best friends, they would never actually always you know, come up and with their promises. So that's a nice lovely thing, you're a religious man, you're a monk, so you have that high level of trustworthiness and honesty. And of course I take things like that for granted these days. I live with a whole group of wonderful monks, even coming here to our Buddhist society, you're all really virtuous people who may not be as perfect as the monks and the nuns, but nevertheless, you've got a higher state of virtue. And just that by itself, the goodness in you, that is something which makes my life much more peaceful. I, you know, I can trust when I give you the glasses to clean, that you will clean them as best you possibly can, even more than you clean your own glasses is for a monk. That kindness and that goodness is something which is impressive and you don't see that all over the world. So that virtue, I bow to that, that goodness, that trustworthiness, because that's something was so important for me. That's why I find it easy to bow to virtue. But the next thing I bow to is even more beautiful and that's peace. How difficult is it when you see people arguing, I see people fighting, 
even in their house there's no peace. And in our world, why do people have to fight, fight wars? Can't we find some peace somewhere? We all remember that time in the First World War. It was at Christmas time. The soldiers in opposite armies decided to play a game of football rather than shoot their weapons. And that was inspiring that when peace happens, that means when there's no victors, there's no sort of losers. When people have lost their peace, we've lost everything. How can you live in our world when you're just worried about bullets or things being stolen or being attacked? You can't live like that. So when you find some peace, and some of the places where I live are just so incredibly peaceful. And believe it or not, even this afternoon, we came in early to Nolamara for the weekend. And even this uh, novice monk sitting next to me, he said he couldn't believe how quiet it was in the monks' quarters, just in the back over here. In the city, we, we could feel that peace here. And of course, we've got nice huts. We're not right in the middle of uh, noisy areas. And that peace was beautiful. And of course, you know, I live in a cave. And those of you who visit that cave, I don't know, but maybe I would just put you in there by yourself and lock the door just for one minute. It's totally silent. It's one of the reasons why it was built. We've got two doors, it's underground, lots of rocks and concrete and all sorts of stuff. It would be a great bunker if Kim Jong-un uh, just uh, decides to send a, <laughs> a nuclear missile in our direction. But it's so quiet in there, that's why I love it in there. And that peace, that silence is something which I worship. What do you mean worship? You find worth in it, a very high degree of worth in it. So I find it so easy to bow to. I'm lowering my head because the worth of peace is so important. When you find peace in your mind, in meditation, it's not boring at all, it's just incredibly delightful. I've had some nice meditations today, and even here, just I went over a bit, a couple of minutes, I'm sorry, but I didn't want to come out. Meditation gets so peaceful and so joyful and blissful, you just, oh, do I really have to come out? <laughs> and of course you do, to make sure I can give a nice talk to each one of you. And so this is the peace of mind. It's something very easy to worship. That's always my second bow, is to peace. You know, sometimes we talk about meditation, and people say it's all about concentration. No, concentration is never peaceful. Concentration is hard. But stillness, letting go, putting things down, when everything becomes very peaceful. I've done this similarly many times, but here it comes again, in case that this talk is too deep for some people. How do I keep this water perfectly still? I can't hold it still. Even if I'm mindful and I focus, I concentrate, it moves. The only way I can keep this perfectly still is, yeah, put it down. You know, I remember hearing this simile by one of the politicians who came to one of the Thai functions and she started her little speech. A wise man once said, and I told her afterwards, it wasn't a wise man, it was a monk, it was me. <laughs> I invented that story. But anyway, that if you put it down, it's, it's moving, but after a while it becomes perfectly still. It's peaceful, with no effort. You don't have to hold it still. It's almost as that stillness is its natural uh, phenomena, its default state. And just like Ajahn Chah used to say, it's been a, I'm not sure how it's been in Perth, but the last week it's been very calm, hardly any wind. And sometimes in the gaps between the, the rain, you can see the full moon in the evening up in the forest of Bodhinyana Monastery in Serpentine. It's absolutely gorgeous. There's hardly any sound. And the full moon was there to sort of light your way wherever you wanted to walk. And it was not that cold. 
So those stillnesses and peace, those are just really get to my heart. That's really, that's religion. That's what inspires me, the peace and stillness. And when you're peaceful inside, it's amazing just how you can share that peace with others. Sometimes people think, okay, you're a monk, but what are you doing for the world? Sometimes just being peaceful and just walk into a shop somewhere, walk down the street or just talk to somebody. You're talking with a very peaceful mind. And people can feel that. And it's incredibly attractive, peace. So that's why I can worship peace so easily. Bow to it. It's gorgeous. And think, why am I a monk? What do I get out of this? I don't get any money. I still have to work hard, even though I'm in my 70s. And there's no sign of retirement. <laughs> and so sometimes you get nice food, but sometimes too much of it or the wrong food. You still eat it anyway. <laughs> so sometimes you might get a tummy ache in the evening, but that's not the point. People's kindness is what you feed on and the peace of it. So the next, of course, the third bow is to kindness, compassion. Sometimes people said it should be wisdom, but wisdom with warmth, that's called compassion, kindness. How many kind acts have you seen this week? How many kind acts have you done this week? Little things, like just like opening the door to somebody or giving someone some food. I don't mean a mug, that's tradition. You see someone who's hungry and you give them something to eat. That's beautiful, that's w wonderful. It was a couple of weeks ago. You know, as a monk, you know, it's your job to feed me. And I get fed so much. And this was when I was going to the airport uh, to go to Melbourne, I think it was. And I left on a Saturday morning. And uh, there's no way I could stay here for my lunch. That was, I wouldn't uh, be able to finish my lunch and make it to the airport. So I had to get something on the way. And I was flying on Virgin Airlines and they don't give you anything to eat. So my driver that day was a certain person who's sitting quite close to me in front. <laughs> and he drove me to the airport. But on the way we stopped at a dome cafe to get some lunch. And guess who offered the lunch to him? <laughs> I had a dome card. And that dome card, you got some amount of money which is already on the dome card. You just give it to the people in the front and you can get a meal with it. And so it's the first time in my life as a monk where I <laughs> donated a meal <laughs> to a lay person and he enjoyed it. I, but I enjoyed that meal much more than you did, Nicholas, because I enjoyed the, the, the privilege of giving to somebody. And of course, what happened was, oh, she's not here this evening, uh, one of the people in the accounts department, Madhu, she was just in the same cafe having something to eat. So she, she saw me, I was busted. But not really busted because I was breaking any rules. Busted, she said, what are you doing here? So I'm going to the airport. She said, oh, please wait for a moment. And she gave two big cakes for each one of us, big chocolate cakes. It was very, very nice. And of course, there's no way I can eat that. It's just too much. So I gave it to Nicholas, who went to the Dhammasara Nuns Monastery. And she gave that, those two cakes to the nuns. And the nuns appreciated them so much for the first time they've got a dana from Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> and they sent me a nice email back. Okay, it may be a bit weird that this is happening, but it was a beautiful way of spending a Saturday of kindness and compassion. It is not breaking the rules. It's bending them a little, not doing the tradition as we normally have it, but it's a beautiful way of spending a Saturday morning. And every time I see those kindness, those compassion, that's an important part of Buddhism. And I have to remember that as a leader. Yes, we have all our rules and regulations, but there's also the ways that we use them in a kind way for people. And, uh, please put your hand up, 
because I've been talking about the cat that went to heaven a lot recently. Did I give a talk about the cat that went to heaven here in the last couple of weeks? No, oh, great. Okay, here we go. I'm indulging. Because, you know, as a, as a Buddhist leader, we've got like Vinaya rules. These are rules laid down by the Buddha on how you're supposed to behave and keeping the traditions and making sure you don't do anything which is breaking those traditions. Like, you know, even people in the, in the government, they have these rules and regulations they're supposed to do. But, you know, sometimes I feel they can be a bit restrictive. Stop me doing something which you feel must be right. Like being able to uh, use a, a, a card, a dome card, you know, to give a dana to a good friend. So anyway, this was the story of the cat that went to heaven. The reason I tell this story because this was, I first read this in a book in the Thai temple in London where I used to go you know, almost every day you know, when I was on holiday between um, teaching and my job. I was a lay person at the time. And this book, you couldn't get it out of the library. It was always pre-booked. It was the most popular book in the library. And it was a story about a painter in some small town in Japan many years ago. I think the book is about a hundred years old now. And this painter was incredibly poor. And he wasn't married, but he had a housekeeper looking after him. And one day the local Buddhist temple had a competition. They wanted to have a painting, a big mural of the Buddha's Parinibbana, where the Buddha's passing away, which happened on a Waisak day. And so they were going to just choose lots, you know, put everyone's name in a hat and choose out of you know, good fortune which person would get the contract to paint this painting. And of course the one who got the contract was this poor painter. And he couldn't believe his good fortune. At last he'd have a chance to actually make a career out of painting and have his first painting in the main temple so that the monk came to announce the result and he gave this painter a bit of money so that he could get a canvas and some paint and some food to eat. And that's what the, um, the housekeeper did. She went to the market and got some food, some paints, paint brushes and a canvas. And when she came back from the market, she came with a basket with all the stuff in it. And the housekeeper said, I bought something else as well something special. And then this little cat put her head up out of the basket. I brought the little cat for company as well, because our house is a bit too cold. And then the painter said, we can't afford it. He said, it will keep you company when you're painting. And so this little cat, when it poked its head out of the basket, didn't really know whether she was welcome or not. But it was such a beautiful cat, it just melted the painter's heart. And so the painter said, OK, <laughs> you bought it now. And so the cat came out, and the painter had a good meal for the first meal in months. And then he got everything ready. And before he would do any of the painting, he'd always meditate, first of all, to purify his mind. And then he started painting the picture of the Buddha lying on his right side between the sal trees in Kusinara, on the, the night of his Parinivana, of his passing away. And then the painter was instructed to paint all the animals which came to pay respect to the Buddha in his life. You've got the, the stories of the Buddha and elephants and horses and lions and monkeys and all these animals which would pay respect. And he painted them one by one, one a day. And as he would paint during the day, this little cat would sit next to him, perfectly quiet, silent, not moving. It was amazing, just the discipline of this cat. The cat didn't want to disturb the painter. But every day as they painted his animals, the cat looked more and more depressed. 
and the painter could understand why. He said to the cat, look, there's no record of any cats looking after the Buddha or caring for the Buddha. Cats are always very independent animals. Even in your house, they come and eat, then they go away somewhere. He said, I can't put a picture of you, the cat, in this mural, because if I did, that it would not be accepted. It's not authentic, it's not according to our tradition. So day by day, this little cat got more and more sad. And when the, when the painter was about to finish, he looked at the cat, he looked at the painting. And by this time, there was such a good cat, he said, oh, what the heck? And the last cat in this whole line of animals paying respect to the Buddha was a cat. And the house, <laughs> the housekeeper said, you're going to lose everything now. He said, yes, I know, but it's such a beautiful cat. And when the cat saw its, its figure on the painting, the cat just, its heart just broke. And the cat died and went to heaven. And he said, it was worth it. I may not get any more contracts at all. But what a beautiful thing it is to let compassion be more important than tradition. And so anyway, the next, that night, the priest came. And they looked at that painting. He said, it's very well done, but there's a cat in there. It's not authentic. That never happened. We're going to take your painting to the temple. We will burn it tomorrow morning. And he said, it was worth it. And the following morning, <laughs> he was woken up very early. Because there was a couple of monks waking him up. He said, come, come to the temple now. He wondered what had happened. And when he got to the temple, he found there was a big crowd in front of his painting. They hadn't burnt it yet. He said, come and have a look. And where he'd painted the cat, there's a big empty space. The cat had disappeared. It wasn't there. And they told, they put his attention to the very front of the painting, right next to the Buddha, with the Buddha's hand on his animal, <laughs> was a little cat. <laughs> they said in the Introduction, it was a true story, I don't know <laughs> if it's true or not. But it's the sort of story which gave me a big lesson as a spiritual director of the Buddhist Society of Western Australia and a spiritual patron of the Buddhist Society of Victoria and a Buddhist, uh, the spiritual director of so many other organisations as well. And there's a Brahms Society in Sri Lanka, there's a Brahms Centre in Singapore and I'm involved in all of these. But nevertheless, if you're involved in these things, the most important thing is the kindness, the compassion. And those little acts of compassion, they just melt your heart. Maybe we're not supposed to do this, but it's a compassionate, kind thing to do. And so because of that, that uh, painter became famous, got lots of business, because compassion was more important than traditions. And so, Little stories like that, that's why I always remember that the third bow is to compassion and kindness, which is more important than any, I mean, real compassion. This is not an excuse to break rules. This is a reason to actually to do something which is doesn't harming anybody or harming yourself or taking advantage of anybody, but something which is recognizing the power of kindness. Things like forgiveness. You're not supposed to forgive really bad crimes or what the heck. You know, it's sometimes it's worthwhile doing. It's doing things which other people can't do. You just do it because it shows the power of these things and the hope it gives to the world. It's one of the reasons why when I started talking like this in Malaysia some years ago, it was just after 9-11. And the big talk I gave there, that was actually in um, SBS in Subang Jaya. And I remember that because after I gave a talk, somebody stood up 
And they said, Ajahn Brahm, what would you have done if you were President of the United States at the time when the terrorists blew up these two buildings, the Twin Towers, over in New York? And I said, well, look, if I was a president at that time, I'd just gone on TV and given forgiveness. So too many people have died already. I don't know why you did that, but we forgive everybody involved. Enough with wars and killing people and trying to make a point by seeing how many people we can get killed. Revenge doesn't work. Does it work, revenge? Has anybody tried to take revenge on you because you did something wrong? And I said, <laughs> yeah, that's what I would do if I was President of the United States. <laughs> and I think a lot of people in the audience, Ajahn Brahm for President, <laughs> Ajahn Brahm for President. <laughs> it really touched something because no one else was doing anything like that. They always wanted to have revenge, thinking that you could stop such murder by murdering the other side being more powerful than they are. Hatred doesn't lead to any um, peace in our world. But ways of making peace with kindness, compassion, forgiveness, that does. That's why I bow to that. And of course you know that where this story goes, I never thought of going to this extent with uh, what I was going to say this evening. Years ago, there was I got some friends in many different religions here in Perth and this person, uh, he was the chaplain at Christ, Christ Church Grammar School in Perth. It's a very top Anglican school here and it's a very posh school too. And so because he was a chaplain, I met him because he was also working with some of the cancer group here. And I did a lot of work with the Solaris, they call now cancer group. They're coming to the monastery in a couple of days' time. But anyway, that he said, why didn't you come and give a talk at the school assembly? Remember those assemblies you may have had when you were at school? You know, when somebody comes up and talks all sorts of stuff. I remember when I was a school teacher. I was a school teacher in, in Devon in 1973, I think, 72, 73. And I had to take an assembly one morning, like for four or five days. And I asked the principal, is it okay that I teach the kids meditation? There were about 600 kids there, from 11 to 17. All sat down, maybe a bit more, 700 or something. And I taught them meditation. And the first time I did that, I remember this. This was you know, one of the first times you taught meditation in schools. I had all these kids down there, and I said, now I'm going to teach you some meditation. First thing, you're sitting on the floor, great. Now straighten your backs. Because I was sitting on the stage. It was like one of those Mexican waves they used to have in football matches. Everybody just straighten their backs. Now put your hands in your lap, right hand over your left hand, and close your eyes and watch your breathing. And every one of those kids, boys and girls, complied. Not one of them said anything or giggled or laughed at all. And for five or ten minutes, they watched their breath go in and out and in and out. And when it was finished, because we had to finish to make announcements at this school, you know what happened? They all gave me an ovation, the kids. It wasn't planned at all. It was really meaningful. I'd done something different. I'd, I'd touched their hearts somehow or other, even 11 year olds. It was only afterwards that one of the teachers, a senior teacher, said, What would you have done if one of the kids, kids started laughing? And you know, that's when I broke into a sweat, because I never imagined that. Because if they did, you only needed one, and the whole 600 would have broken into a laugh or a giggle or something you'd have lost them. But I always remember that, somehow or other, I don't know if it's stupidity makes you fearless, but sometimes trust does and kindness does, it's very powerful. But anyway, when I gave this talk at Christchurch Grammar School, <laughs> I was outside the school with the principal and the chaplain. And the chaplain knows me for a long time, uh, Frank Sheehan. 
And the principal, he turned to me and said, Ajahn Brahm, you're a Buddhist. This is a Christian school. When we go into the assembly, the, the, <laughs> the chaplain and I will do a small bow to the shrine, the Christian shrine in the school. You're a Buddhist, you don't need to do any bows. And that's when I took my opportunity. I said to him, I turned to him and I made a serious face. I said, I demand my right to bow to your statue of, the, of, the, of Jesus. And he was shocked. <laughs> Fortunately, the chaplain knew me. I said, listen, there's always something in there which I can respect and that's what I'm going to bow to. I'm not a Christian, I'm a Buddhist, but there's something there, the, the generosity which you have, the service to the, the sick and things like that, I can respect that. And that's what I'm going to bow to. And when I gave my little talk, I gave the talk on bowing and what it means and how that when we know what we're bowing to, to virtue, peace and compassion and kindness, it's so easy to bow. And of course, what happened next, after we went in, I did that stuff, that he organized, the principal organized a visit from the school to Bodhinyana Monastery. I remember that later on, many of the kids came into my cave. You know what they said? This would be a great place for a rave. <laughs> 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 but not only the kids came, but the principal came as well. I always remember that he came in his car, the kids were in buses. And I, I welcomed him and I took him into our main hall in Bodhinyana with this big Buddha statue there. I never said anything. <laughs> I bowed three times to the Buddha and the principal of Christ Church Grammar School bowed right next to me. We bowed together three times to the Buddha. He wasn't bowing to the Buddha. He was bound to what the Buddha meant, to virtue, peace and compassion. So that's one of the reasons why, if you want some harmony between people, go a little bit deeper than just, oh, bowing is right or bowing is wrong or what you're bowing to. Find something in that experience which you can really relate to, which moves you, inspires you, makes you a better human being and other people better human beings. And then it's so easy to do, and it's meaningful as well. <laughs> we never ever think that my religion is better than your religion. <laughs> Otherwise what happens is it's not just Buddhism is better than other religions, but which type of Buddhism is better? My Buddhism is better than your Buddhism or whatever. There's many types of Buddhism and sometimes people do have arguments. <laughs> that just makes no sense to me. That's not Buddhism at all. If we compare, <laughs> which is the best. So, when somebody asks me for a book on comparative religion, I don't know comparative religion. We don't compare. We try and make sure we make use of the best. There's many fruits on the trees or fruits in the supermarket. Find the ripest, sweetest, juiciest fruits, no matter what they are, and make that your lunch. And don't think that one fruit is better than the next. It's what you put into it gives it worth. Okay, talking too much as usual. So, thank you all for listening. So, sada, sada, sada. <laughs> oh, come on, you can do better than that. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Excellent, that's more like it. <laughs> okay. And as usual, that's not what I intended to talk about, so please excuse me. Any questions from the floor, first of all? Questions, comments, complaints? Okay, from the internet. Here you go. Thank you. You're very kind. You work so hard. It's amazing. From Malaysia. Dear Ajahn, does meditation increase intuition? You bet. I notice that my intuition has become stronger after starting to practice meditation. I find this experience somehow overwhelming. Just go for it. 
because the intuition, you go into a deeper knowledge. It's been, this is, many people have suspected this is true, but these days there's many universities and many psychologists, psychiatrists have got nothing else to do, so they're pe making great research on the power of intuition and how intuition is more accurate than logic. It doesn't overcome logic, but when you intuit things, you're feeling just this accumulation of knowledge you've had over so many years. You feel it's right. And then afterwards you work out why it's right. But the intuition comes first. I do that a lot. Sometimes there's many decisions I have to make. And instead of getting stressed out, which decision should it be? I just put as much information as I possibly can into my brain. And then I just meditate on it or sleep on it or something. I let it be. And then afterwards, the next day, it comes quite obvious what I should do. I intuit it. And the meditation gives you more trust in your intuition. Otherwise you think, oh, this can't be right. Oh, it is right. No, it can't be right. And that thinking too much means you're just not making clear decisions at all. You're just tiring your mental faculties so much you get so exhausted, you get sometimes stressed out and depressed. So just make the intuition and you find out just how what it works. And not only that, your meditation clears your mind so the intuition is easier to recognize and is more powerful and more deep. That's the other thing which I love and I thought of maybe talking about that this evening but it's, well I didn't, <laughs> too late now. It's just how when your mind gets very peaceful and very powerful, you can see deeper into things. Your intuition gets much more penetrative. It's sharper and more powerful. You really dig into things. Why do you come and ask questions of me? And why do you keep coming every week? And the reason is obviously there's something which I'm doing which is working. And that intuition comes from meditation. I give my very best talks after a good meditation. When I'm tired and the meditation is not so strong, the intuition is not so powerful. And it's incredible what you can do when the meditation is really buzzing along. Don't be overwhelmed by these things. Be inspired. Actually, no, it's good to be overwhelmed. Your sense of self gets overwhelmed. You're, you're buying in, or not buying in, but getting into a much more pure form of wisdom, which doesn't come from you. It just is not coming from some heavenly being. It's just coming from, you might even call the universe, from clear seeing. You're knowing what needs to be done and why. It has, <laughs> honestly, some of the things I've said have shocked me. <laughs> How can I say that? But it worked. Okay, please excuse me, but this is one of those intuitive moments. You said from Malaysia, this person, this is what I did over in the former, uh, well, still it's a BGF, Buddhist Gem Fellowship. This was uh, this time in Petaling Jaya. And they asked me all sorts of interesting problems. And this one I was happy to do because it was testing, doing something I've never done before. And it was counseling to somebody, a, a middle-aged woman, who'd been very violently raped. Now that's a shocking thing even to mention. And I've got no experience, no training in this at all. I'm a male. And so she came up to me and started describing the experiences she had. I was given some background that she'd been to many counsellors, psychologists, psychiatrists. No one had helped her, that's why I was like last resort. So one thing I did know though, if you're the last resort, any usual normal responses are not going to work. So I did the other thing which being a monk you're good at, just making your mind very silent, and very peaceful. And as she was talking to me, and not getting upset, it's a hard thing to do, and describe how some people can treat another person. Not getting upset, but being very still and peaceful. 
and when she finished describing what she'd experienced, I talked, and the words which came out of my mouth shocked me. And the words which came out was, you're so lucky to have been raped like that. I wasn't being demeaning, because even I was shocked. What did I mean by that? And I told her afterwards, I could see where I was coming from. But this was not totally unplanned. I said that, you know, you're a very a woman with great spiritual resources inside you, got a huge strength inside there. You're going to find a way through this. Mm. I'm only just part of that journey of healing. But the reason I said that is because I know you're going to get through this. And when you do get through this, you're going to say something which I can never say when you meet another person who's had similar experiences. You can say, I know how you feel. And also, I know the way out. Hold my hand, follow me. I can never say that. That's never happened to me. You can only taste 1% at most of the difficulty, the trauma of that. I said, you can find that way out. That gave the experience meaning for her. It wasn't purposelessness. She had something she could do with that. I said, that's why you're lucky. You're going to get through this. And when you do, you're going to be a great resource and help to others. She didn't sort of hit me or sue me or just uh, refer me to the police or anything. But she thanked me doesn't work for everyone. It's not something you can prepare. It's just something the intuition comes up and it makes you say things which sometimes you're surprised at what you said. But it worked for her. That's the power of intuition. You know, you weren't there, but that's what happened. So it is a bit overwhelming, a bit dangerous sometimes, but it's powerful how well it works. Next question from Borneo. What to do when you feel like you don't know what to do with your life? That's a very easy answer. Do nothing. <laughs> because a lot of time people want to do something, to go somewhere, to get somewhere. And have they have goals in life. When you don't know what to do with your life, just sit there and do nothing. Meditate. Get your mind empowered. Because that's what happens when you get into some good meditation. Your insights get so strong. Your mindfulness gets charged up. You get huge amounts of energy. And then you don't really need to plan what you want to do in life. You're ready to respond to life as it comes to knock on your door. Sometimes you feel like spiritual path is so precious but you're not ready to leave lay life. You don't have to at this point. Sometimes it's lay life leaves you. You don't leave it. Sometimes it's just you hang around the Buddhist centers or you hang around the monasteries and sometimes just why not? And even if you not, may not have a bald head or brown robes, you're almost like living like a monastic. And you see it's beautiful benefits. So when you don't know what to do with your life, do nothing. Why do you always have to be doing something? You know, there's another gentleman, he sometimes teaches here, that's Jacob. And he was an old friend, he was a monk before. And I remember him, I was going into the office with a bunch of papers here. And he asked me, Ajahn Brahm, how are you? And I gave the stupid response, I'm getting there. Have you ever said that? I'm getting there. And then quite wisely he asked me, where exactly are you getting to? <laughs> okay, you caught me out. And I said, I'm getting to one of, at that time, only two places. Karakata or Fremantle Cemetery. That's what I'm getting like this. <laughs> and of course he laughed. And so now, when people ask me, how are you, Ajahn Brahm? If I'm smart, I'll say, I'm being here. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not getting anywhere. 
I'm being here. And that's also why, to emphasize that point, every time you go on an aircraft or somewhere, like I went to Singapore for a few days and then to Melbourne twice, you know, it's very hard to see any human beings in Singapore. I don't know what the population is, but there's very few human beings in Singapore. There's millions of human goings. Human goings and human doings, but human beings? We've lost the ability to be. We pull that off into the future. When we get there, then we'll be. But right now, we're not being. We're not here. So that's with a spiritual life. Learn how to be a human being instead of a human going somewhere. From the USA, how do we deal with bitterness while dealing with people who continuously do wrong to you? You know that there was this monastery, uh, uh, this was, uh, not uh, Gurdjieff, have you ever heard of the name Gurdjieff? He was a Russian spiritual seeker who managed to set up a little ashram in France, I think, uh, just after the Second World War. And when he died, they were going through his papers, and they found that one of the members of this ashram, who was just a really difficult character, many times they asked, get rid of this guy, he causes so much problems. And for those of you who are like ops managers in the BSW way, which person is always causing problems for you? You know, in a monastery or in a sort of a Buddhist society of Western Australia. Which of those persons? Anyway, this is one person really stood out, a big troublemaker. And they'd asked him many times, please get rid of this guy. And he said, no. And afterwards, they found that he was the only, once Gurdjieff died, he was the only person in the whole ashram who Gurdjieff was paying to be there. Everyone else had to donate or pay some fee to be there. But this one, Gurdjieff was paying him to be there. So when, you, <laughs> when I think of all the troublemakers in Bodhinyana Monastery, I think when you die, you probably find out. <laughs> so my supporters were paying them to be there. <laughs> no. Anyway, I thought it was quite interesting that sometimes a troublemaker, they put you on edge so you can go deeper into wisdom and intuition. So with people who continuously do wrong to you, look at them as teachers. The mosquitoes in Thailand would always do wrong to me. You know, you'd just be getting peaceful in the meditation, you know what they would do? They wouldn't just bite you, they'd go bzz, 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 which in mosquito language meant I'm gonna bite you, bzz, 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 bzz. I'll get over with you, yeah, when I'm ready, said mosquito, bzz, bzz, bzz. <laughs> Look, I'm not doing anything wrong to you, leave me alone, come back later on. So instead of dealing with bitterness to them, you made peace with them. When you make peace with them, the mosquitoes can't harm you. So continuously do wrong to you. They can do whatever they like, but you don't take the wrong into your heart. It's like giving you a gift, they're trying to upset you, but you refuse to accept that gift. From Germany, how do I deal with distractions in day-to-day -day life? Why do I keep seeking excitement, and why is it very hard to let go of central happiness? And the distractions, somebody told me about this the other day, they were addicted to distractions. There's email on this. <laughs> Why do we keep looking at emails? <laughs> or looking at sensory data? Oops, excuse me. It's like, almost like uh, we, we seek distraction. There's nothing there. Just to check the news. How's the economy going? How's the AFL football match going? If there is one, I don't know. So, why do we seek those distractions? And it's, it's an escape because we're afraid of peace. Why do people, even in airports, there's always music playing all the time. In, in elevators, in um, shopping centers, always something going on. Can't we have it silent? Because people are addicted to, to distractions because they're afraid of peace. Where in this planet can you rest in peace? In the grave. That's really spooky, isn't it? 
Anyway, lastly from Thailand. I was born with a moderate mobility impairment. I often exclude myself from things to not burden people. How do I balance relationships and not annoying people? Ask the people you're having a relationship with. And you'll find that they say, no, please give me the opportunity to help you. It's a privilege to do service for you. you know, today, when I arrived here, uh, just after lunch, I came early here, uh, there was our, um, what was it, the ops manager, not the ops manager, the administrative assistant, that's L. Does a really good work here. If you come here during the day or you send an email, she's the one who answered it. But anyway, that she came out and said, Oh, Ajahn Brahm, how is your robe? Because a few weeks ago when I came here, I needed to wash it. I didn't know how to use the washing machine. And so she helped out. And so today, the time before she pressed the wrong button, it took forever to wash the robe. I was lucky to have it in the evening. But this time she said, <laughs> she said I'll, can, please, can I do it? I said, actually, it doesn't need to be washed. But she said, oh, please. And she gave me these big, gooey eyes, like many of you do when you want to do something for me. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so she washed my robe for me this afternoon. Not because it needed washing, because she needed to do it for me. It's a different way of looking at things. And that's why you may have some inability or mobility impairment. That's a great gift to others. They need to help you, even if you don't need to be helped. Please let them. It's a great way of allowing people to be compassionate for you. And after a while you talk to them and say, oh, thank you for helping me. I get a lot of joy of helping others. Just like feeding Nicholas the other day. I, got a lot I didn't need to do that. I just got so much fun out of it. Can you understand? There was another question here. I'll just do it quickly. I often feel that people say things that I was just thinking about. You're a wonderful person. Well done. I hope you were thinking about that. I often dismiss it just as coincidence, but it could mean something more. If what they, s if what they say is something nice and compassionate, then great, well done. But if it's just, uh, it's not just coincidence, it must be something powerful. But if they say something which is bad, because you've been thinking some bad thoughts, then that's just coincidence. <laughs> Give it the most positive bent you can possibly make. Because you can't know for real, for truth. Sometimes it's true, but a lot of time it's just coincidence. If it's something bad, it's coincidence. If it's something which is really positive and meaningful and wonderful, then give it the benefit of the doubt and say that's something magical. Does that make sense? I hope it does, because I'm finishing off now. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for listening. I've an extra 10 minutes this evening, no extra charge. <laughs> okay, so now I'm gonna bow three times. What am I bowing to? Fortune. Virtue, virtue, <laughs> peace and compassion, not fortune, fortune, power, and <laughs> <some> money, <laughs> no. Supati Pano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sangang Namami